and it is just 601. Oops, where is this? Okay. Um, do we have a Sybil? Or are you going to handle it, Jeremy? I'm going to handle it. Um, okay. All right. If we start the recording. Um, and then uh, I, I did notice that there's a phone number, uh, 802-282-1573 on the call. Um, do you want to identify yourself for the minutes or would you prefer to remain anonymous? Sure, it's uh, Ted Barnett, delegate from Williamstown. Hey, extra quorum. There you go. Okay. Right. Happy to be I extra am... quorum. <laughs> <laughs> cool, <Ben. clears throat> I am, um, what am I doing? I'm calling to order the May 14th annual governing board meeting for CB Fiber. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? I'm going to be making one addition. I ne neglected to put down the election of officers, but this is our annual meeting and it's a known thing. So we're going to, we'll do that. Um, after the marketing update and before the preliminary pro proposal discussion, um, unless people want to do it now. I'm not seeing that. Okay. Uh, the next thing is, are there any public comment? Not seeing any public comment. So let's go to prior meeting minutes. Jeremy, do you have a motion for me? Uh, yes, just a minute. Uh, motion to approve the April 9th, 2024 meeting minutes as drafted. Second. Motion made by Jeremy Matt, seconded by Tom Fisher. Do I have any discussion about the motion? Any um, opposed to hi, the motion? Hi, this is oh, Sybil. Sybil. I, I didn't notice that we had approved the minutes for the March meeting. On the minutes I had, they, that was delayed and they were not approved. Oh, okay. Well, why don't we do that as a friendly amendment to uh, include the March 12th, 2024 meeting minutes as drafted? Thank you. Second. Okay, Tom, do you agree? Okay. All right. Friendly amendment accepted by the second of Tom Fisher. Do I have any discussion about that? Do I have any objections? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Um, Treasurer's report. Lori Bath, what do you got for us? Well, if I can get back on. <coughs> um, <laughs> We did get the bank, the uh, bank reconciliations and all the financial statements from Bonnie last night. Um, and I did have a chance to look them over briefly. Um, I will let her and David go through more detail. But um, as we are right now, we have $3,655,448.10 in the, in the three bank accounts. Um, and uh, I know that they did get some of the grants that became that were from the ARPA funds, um, and they used some of those for the towns that they had, and um, so that is partially done. And they utilized five hundred and twenty-four thousand one hundred and forty-eight dollars of the construction grant income advance to CV Fiber by VCBB, and they'll go into more detail of what went on and where that went. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the treasurer's report? I think Bonnie was going to go over the executive summary, Savon. Okay. All right. That's fine. Let's do that. <clears throat> okay. So actually, I'm going to step it back a little bit because um, we're on the agenda to review the March uh, quarterly financial statements um, that have been reviewed by the Finance Committee. Um, the April ones are going to be going in front of the Finance Committee Thursday evening, and then will be presented to you formally next governing board meeting. Um, so really everything that Lori Beth said was kind of like, you know, took, took the wind out of my sail. She had all the good news to say. Sorry um, about that. No, no, I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. It's great. Um, 
So through March or in March, we uh, utilized about 675,000 of the grant. Uh, the good news is, as you know, we've, we're all struggling um, with the inventory and we seem to have uh, tightened all the loops on that. We now are able to print our monthly uh, inventory. And so not only is March updated, but the April financial statements that you'll be seeing next month and that the Finance Committee will be reviewing on Thursday have up-to-date inventory, which is fantastic. Um, and I, it's also my understanding that we're going to be able to print by DA so that we can um, pull the costs that we need for construction that we've already paid for uh, in inventory, which again is a is a huge step forward. So that's that's really great step. Uh, the town ARPA money is being set uh, spent uh, with installation. So far, we've spent. Four uh, in four towns through March, um, with about 271,000 spent uh, allocated to four different towns. In April, I will tell you that we had 74 installations, um, and so that number is ramping up quite quickly. The great thing is that we have the VCBB match uh, grant amendment that's been signed and approved, and we can draw that down, which we're going to do. Um, even though we can't spend it with the entire amount, we have to spend it based on the individual towns, but it will be interest in interest bearing accounts, which will uh, help as well. So, you know, the, the financial statements are um, going along as we've projected. There's no surprises. The cash flow is as we projected and as we highlighted to you last meeting. Um, so we're on target with that and uh, moving ahead as we expected. Anybody have any questions? I, I just want to just emphasize for the board three things that, that Bonnie said that I think are wins for us. The first is better visibility and control of our inventory. That's a real big win for us guys because there's a lot of work that's been put into this and we didn't have that visibility just a couple months ago. So it's a real win. I wanna thank Janiel and her team for all the work you guys did to get that squared away. The other is she reported 74 installs in April and that beat our beat our run rate uh, by Janiel probably over a dozen. So that that's a great win and also getting that match in is a big win for us as well. I know that was a lot of work uh, that went into that too. So I just wanted to highlight those three big wins. Thank you. Thanks. I, I did have one question. Uh, I'm just kind of toss it out here. It's probably not the best time to do it, but I, wh when we were first starting up, we were talking about, well, we can expect it to cost $30,000 per mile of installation. And then we revised that up to 56,000 per mile. Do we know what our per mile cost is per, for installation, what we've spent at this point? If we don't, it's no big deal. I was just curious. I mean- Bonnie, you want to answer that? Yeah, I don't have that with me, um, but we can get it and see what the average is based on a calculation that we can do. So I'd be happy to follow okay. up with you with that. Yeah, sure. that'd be, that'd be, I think, I think it's a, kind of a metric for where we started and where we're ending up and kind of an idea of where it's going to be going because that number probably isn't going to go down very much. Right. And I, all. you know, I, I think the big um, right now, the big question is too with some of the make ready costs because they were estimated as being super high, but now there's other avenues that those make ready costs are coming down or potentially going to be less. Um, so I think that right now, I mean, do you agree with that, Janelle, that that's kind of a big So uh, we, yeah, we've done a lot of negotiating with Green Mountain Power, which was helpful and also that uh that win with um hardwick electric department has made it more predictable in the make ready space and uh and and we've really held green mountain power to their word so yes and uh, and also we also just got a, a refund of forty nine thousand dollars from WEC for for overpayment of um of make ready so yes we are seeing a trend in the right direction more predictability and less than we had originally anticipated or had anticipated a couple months ago i should say right yeah nice that's <laughs> good um, anybody else I, have any go ahead Lori Beth. 
Um, I would also like to add that I was contacted by the auditors and they are now back on time that they are going back to our audit and plan. I have a meeting with them on next Thursday and they plan to have this done pretty quickly now. Great. Yeah. Woohoo, audit. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, does anybody have any other financial questions that they want to ask? Any information that they'd like a little enlightenment on or anything like that? No? All right. I'm going to move on to construction materials and warehousing update. That would be Janiel. Sure, so we have a, a major change happening in warehousing that is Wild Blue Yonder, um, also known as um, Straight Line Broadband. It, their contract ends in just a week. So uh, on 520, we are transitioning, what well, we have been transitioning for the past 90 days per 90 day noticing, but they're, they're uh, going to be replaced by Andy K Broadband Warehouse Management. And so this goes to a shared resource for Eddie K. Broadband and us. This will be a better use of our warehouse space, better use of personnel, and also cross-sharing of materials and closer watch on our on our inventory, which um, Body mentioned and David highlighted as a huge win for us. This is going to make our audits easier later um, in future years. So th that's a huge change in the warehousing. So we are transitioning um, for for better efficiencies, um, e easier easier audits in the future. Um, as far as materials go, we haven't ordered any new materials. We're waiting on additional funding to order more. However, we have we have we have a significant amount o over five million dollars of materials in the warehouse now, and that is more than we need to finish up the the DAs, which by the way are are the ones in construction are, are finishing up most likely by next month. Plus, we have most of the materials needed for the next uh, DAs that we plan on building. We haven't fully uh, pulled the trigger on any of those, on any of those notices to proceed on new construction, but, and we will need to order some more materials. Mostly these are consumables and low lead time items. Um, and so we, we, will be ordering materials as needed as new DAs open up, but we have most of them that we need now. So that is, that's the warehousing and materials update generally. Construction is getting uh, close to being complete um, in CLO3. That's the one area that we uh, had held off on or we had to hold off on because we didn't get the licensing right away, but because we did finally get the licensing from Hardwick Electric, we're most likely going to open CLO3. And again, we don't know the exact date. We we are still finishing up construction, but definitely, well, I shouldn't say that word, but we anticipate by the end of this construction season, we'll be able to open up CLO3 or most of it. There will be some pockets that we haven't opened up. Anybody have any questions for Janelle about this thing, agenda item? I lost my agenda. Construction materials and warehousing. <laughs> I'm not seeing any. All right, let's move on to operations update and outlook. So we um, let at 11 o'clock today, we had 200 and 84 installs and at two o'clock today we had 286 installs so waitsfield is really knocking it out of the park for us at our last two weeks ago uh, well not even about nine days ago uh, at the may 5th um staff report we had 250 or we had just passed 250 250 was the confirmed so we have we have really increased our in our installs um we do, I, I can't say that we're going to get that many consistently, but we are consistently getting 10 to 15 a week. So we're we're being conservative, guardedly optimistic on how many installs we can get, but it absolutely has picked up. And Waitsfield told me today that they just hired two new people that they're going to be training. So they are they're doing an incredible job and and growing, growing with us as needed. It, it appears that we are we have at least that that I, I can count on the 10 to 15 of installs a week, and I'm feeling confident about that. 
Any comments, questions? Tom Fisher, go ahead. Uh, just a comment. I uh, was chatting with my neighbor today who has Starlink and was informed that they are changing their rate structures, that yeah. places where there are is easy access to satellites or good access to satellites are having their rates reduced by $30 a month and places where there is not good access is having it increased by $30 a month. Maybe somebody with Starlink can correct me if I'm missing something there, but it sounded to me like everybody in our area is in the second category and they all have their rates go up. Um, and so there could potentially be a better take rate for us in that case, but just want to toss that out there. Yes, I, I had my time. rates go up. Oh, they will be going up in June, a $30 increase with Starlink. David Mannix, go ahead. Yeah, back to Janelle, your comment. Do you know what's in the pipeline in the DAs we've completed that are not yet installed? This is great news that we're accelerating our rate, but do we know yeah. what? Um, is so I, I, I am going to ask Olivia if she has that number in front of her. What I can tell you that Waitsfield did give me today is that there are to 28 customers that are scheduled for installs. Um, so I, 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 I don't have the the total queue number up in front of me, but I think that's available on, I, I believe that's available on um, our crowd fiber platform. I'm not sure if, 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 if Olivia can speak to that or not. Yeah, it would take me a couple of minutes. I can certainly pull up yeah. the number. I just don't have it right now. Okay, thank you. All right. Alan Gilbert, and in case you didn't know, your camera doesn't appear to be on, Alan. I'm having or the trouble hood with, might be up closed. No, I'm yeah. having trouble with the camera. I can't figure it out. But you can okay, hear me okay. okay? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Uh, I had a question based on something I think Olivia said at the beginning of the meeting, and that's that we are losing some customers because they're being told that they have to have a conduit dug. Can you... I? I've been confused about this because I thought our policy has been from the beginning, if you ha currently have an aerial connection of either electricity or or phone, that's what you're going to get at your house. And you won't have to have a, 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 a new conduit dug, which you never had before. What, what, what triggers the need for a new conduit to be dug at a potential customer site? So I can answer that. I can I can speak to that. But um, I also I, I want to see if Lu Lucas might be able to supplement what I say. What I can tell you is that Waitsfield has confirmed as of today that 85 people need conduit, 25 need rotting. And what how they determine that is they go out and they actually do a scout. So they get eyes in the field and they determine whether uh, whether conduit is required or not. However, they also informed us that it's not 100% sure. So they might not have used a critical eye when they did their first scout, and they might have to do a revisit to determine, well, maybe an overhead or aerial is possible, even though it in the notes, in the crowd fiber notes, it said a, a conduit is required. So if we take a more critical view of it, maybe we could go out and find a way around um, the, the conduit requirement so that some customers might be able to get aerial, even though it was originally targeted as um, as needed conduit. And the reason I'd say Lucas might be able to add to this is because Lucas himself went out and did like individual visits <laughs> during the winter, like way above and beyond customer call of service to see what we could actually do even though we, they were told no. So I, I wanna see if, if Lucas can add anything to that. Yeah, so generally speaking, if it says they need conduit, then it's because the existing conduit that's already there has phone, it has cable, it has, uh, some, you know, the, it, it, it's just capacity. So otherwise, if there's an existing aerial drop, then they will use that. But if there's an existing underground drop, then they would prefer to keep to that. Um, but they do give the option, if it's possible, to do an aerial drop. Um, it might be a bit of an eyesore. So what I've been seeing is some folks kind of steer away from that, but some folks are, are very much on board. So it's basically what's existing already. Thank you. Is it true too that um, you can't run anything through the electrical conduit as well? So they might have electrical through a conduit, but that doesn't mean we can use that conduit for fiber. Correct, yes. Anybody else have any other questions for operations? Jeremy Mack, go ahead. 
Uh, but presumably, if they had like phone in a conduit and they are willing to have that phone line ripped out, then we could install fiber in that conduit. Is that correct? Yeah, so kind of the stance has been if they're willing to kind of rip that out on their own, um, then we can revisit it. Um, but nobody, you know, like another provider does not want to rip out somebody else's cabling. Um, so if they were willing to understood, maybe say we went ahead and, and made room, then we could do another scout. Chuck, did, did you want to say something or not? You put your hand you back got down. answered. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good. Anybody else? Hey, let's move on to the marketing update and outlook, please. Alrighty, um, I will start with uh, future planning. Um, so we have our next event scheduled for June 22nd, uh, Worcester Town Hall, Saturday, first Saturday of the summer. Um, we're hoping that the sunshine is uh, is cooperating with us that day. Um, but we're going to do a light breakfast reception starting from 10 to 10.30, followed by a presentation from 10.30 to 11.15. Um, again, we are doing this for a couple of reasons. Um, First and foremost, we will likely hit our 300th customer install, so it's a pretty big milestone for us. We also have three of our founding delegates who are leaving, um, so we want to honor them and express our gratitude and also answer uh, just general questions from our, our neighboring community. So um, all are welcome to attend. I did include an RSVP link within the staff report. Uh, a more formal invite will come in the weeks to come. Um, but if you are interested in attending, um, we would really welcome your attendance. Um, and if you're interested in attending a sister CUD event, uh, NEK Broadway, Broadband actually has an event, an all-day event scheduled the same day, about an hour away. Um, they are providing lunch for anyone who wants to come um, starting at 1 p.m. that afternoon. So I will send back-to-back -back details. Um, you could have breakfast and lunch provided all for you on the same day. So um, it's going to be a big day for us along with our other sister CUDs, so jam-packed. Um, in terms of uh, surveys, uh, surveys have worked really well for us. I'm a firm advocate in surveys and learning more about our communities and, again, taking out some of those biases that we may have. Um, so we actually issued a new town engagement survey to ask why people might be hesitant in switching over to fiber. Uh, we've gotten about 30 responses. It's a pretty good uh, response rate. Um, and I would say that the predominant response is the affordability component. Now, affordability could be the pricing model for our services, for the packages themselves. Um, others alluded to the affordability component regarding conduit. Um, so I will be batching those responses and, partic and particularly I'm interested in creating a piece of content on our website to address some of those hesitations. Um, but all in, it was really good feedback for us to learn and potentially evolve um, some of our communications based on why people are hesitant, some of those friction points. Uh, the biggest one for us, so I know that we've gotten feedback before, there's a state of gray between getting your site survey done and getting installed. Those are the two definitive milestones on the customer timeline, right, for CV Fiber. Now, there's a lot of different intricacies in terms of the diagnostics that come out of a site survey. Um, so we actually met with the Waitsfield team to figure out if we can create an email marketing sequence so essentially every single time we learn a new piece of information, we can email a customer with that bit of information. Now we wanted to make sure those emails are timely, accurate and specific enough based on those milestones. And we actually whiteboarded everything on a screen and we found that there's way too many layers. There's if then scenarios, there's a lot of different things that could potentially not be sent in a timely manner or things shift operationally on the technician side so quickly at Waitsfield. So as a result of that call, uh, Waitsfield actually offered to do uh, a customer service call to everyone who has received a site survey who, and who has not yet been installed. They, as of this morning, we learned that their senior customer service rep has done 25 calls kind of as test case scenarios to go through site survey results. And they plan on doing this for everybody moving forward. And in addition to that, they've instituted follow-up calls 
after you get your install, you get a call the next day um, just asking about your experience. So again, more of a system of checks and balances, but we're really hoping that helps clear the air. Um, for any questions, you know, lingering questions regarding, do I need conduit? What's involved? What happens next? This essentially gives you a primary point of contact at Waitsfield. So when they call after the site visit, the customer is given a name and a phone number of somebody that they can contact at Waitsfield? Correct. Cool. Cool. Yeah. John Reed, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out. I mean, this was when I first heard about this, I guess it was Tom who raised it. It seems like it could be a really significant problem. And uh, going through all the processes and figuring out what didn't work is a great way. Thomas Edison did it to get to what does work. And um, I, I think it's an important issue. And I'm, I'm thrilled that, um, Olivia, you're able to work out what you did. I think it's uh, you only get one chance to um, impress a customer the first time, a potential customer the first time. So thank you for doing that. And since I have the floor, I um, also wanted to say related, I really appreciate the metrics at the beginning of the uh, staff report. I think that's extremely helpful. And uh, thank you for doing it. Janiel. That's Anybody it. else have any questions or comments? I actually just wanted to bring up one other oh, milestone. Um, we, go have, ahead. we have now marketing automation in place. So as soon as somebody gets installed and marked installed on the back end of CrowdFiber, uh, we have an email, an introductory email from CB Fiber with some key resources and then a follow-up survey that's sent four weeks after that. So makes my life easier. Uh, we've had an open rate of about 70%. Uh, again, this helps on with on the retention side moving forward. So we're really pleased with that. What's an open rate? Uh, essentially, how many people actually open your your email, <laughs> and then you, you can get get through as granular as click through rates on it too. You're watching me. You, you watch me open the email. <laughs> uh, I better I better change my clothes. Okay. Is there? John, read your hand. Quick note on that. That, to... um, that also can slightly underestimate what the actual open rate is because many people, including me, do not allow trackers to load. So when my e when I read my email, there is no external indication that I've read my email. But um, so you can get false negatives that way, although you can't really get. Well, the false positive would be somebody actually clicked on the email but didn't bother reading it. So eh, error bars either way. Actually, just, just to jump in, you can get false positives now due to preview rendering in certain email clients. So it's it's not a totally <laughs> accurate, but it is a good directional metric. That's good. Good to know the things you learn. John Reed, your hand is still up or is that up again? That's, that's a mistake. Okay. So that was marketing. Olivia, are you done? Did you have anything else all, for us? I'm all set. Thank uh, you. OK. All right. Wait, there's something in the chat. And there's notes. What the heck? OK, that was Chuck. Chuck is just talking over there. What is meeting notes? There's such a thing as meeting notes. What? OK. All right. All right. Back back on. Oh, my god. Don't let me don't let me wander. The next thing is election of officers. This is an annual meeting. It is a standard thing that in May we have to elect officers. The positions are chair, vice chair, treasurer, and clerk. Clerk, yes, clerk. Um, and so I am going to call on Chuck. <laughs> Go ahead, Chuck. What were you going to say? I nominate Siobhan Paracone for chair. <laughs> I was going to ask Alan to take over this since I'm the chair. Alan, will you take over the handling of the chair election? Sure, I will. And I'll ask Chuck to uh, say something. <laughs> Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to uh, nominate Siobhan. Are there any I don't other nominations? Think you need seconds on nominations, if I recall correctly. I think That's you're true. right. Don't well, bring you the heart, moved. Chuck. You, you Are there any motion, other nominations? 
are, are there any other <laughs> nominations? Hearing none, I will close the nominations. And I guess we should take a vote. All those in favor of Siobhan for being our chair, well, continuing to be our Alan, chair, say I. Alan, in, in the uh, past, haven't we just said instruct the clerk to cast one vote because we only have one nominee? Well, you know, I was going to do that. And then I thought, what if somebody doesn't want to vote for some yeah. reason, you know, to make a statement or something like that? And and I mean, that, that's not saying anything for or against Siobhan, but I I, I okay. sort of worry about making the presumption that everybody is going to vote for the, for one person. So. So I heard I heard nobody uh, uh, saying no. And uh, I, I think, Siobhan, congratulations. You are our, our continuing um, chief and bottle washer here. Thank you. OK. All right. So I will take up the next the next election, which is for vice chair. Um, I am opening the floor to nominations for vice chair. I'd like to nominate Tom Fisher. Sorry, Tom. Second. <laughs> Do I have any other nominations for vice chair? OK, I'm not seeing any other nominations. Do I I am going to close the floor for nominations? Oh, Simon has something he wants to say. Um, do do I have any objections to Tom Fisher for vice chair? Or any abstentions? I am seeing no objections or abstentions. Therefore, Tom Fisher has been re-elected as vice chair. The next position is treasurer. Do I have nominations for treasurer? Do we vote on treasurer? Is treasurer a voted, voted position? They're an officer, yes. right? So we got to vote for yeah, it. Okay, yeah. So. yeah. All right. I'd like to nominate Lori Beth Putnam for treasurer. Do I have any other nominations for treasurer? <laughs> this all feels very pro, pro forma. Um, so uh, hearing no other nominations for treasurer, I am closing the floor to nominations. Do I have any objections to Lori Beth as treasurer? Sure. I'm not seeing any objections. Do I have any uh, abstentions for Lori Beth? as treasurer. I'm not seeing any abstentions. Lori Beth, congratulations. You are reappointed as treasurer for the next year. Um, and clerk, clerk, do I have any nominations for clerk? I'll nominate I will... Germany at Jeremy, Matt. Second. Okay. I... Oh, we don't need a second. Okay. Second. I, I'll do I, it anyhow. I, I third Just it. I third enforce it. the uh, enforce the big movement <laughs> behind you there, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I have any other nominations for clerk? I'm not seeing any other nominations for. Oh, Jeremy Hansen's got his hand up. Go ahead, Jeremy. I I, I just wanted just wanted to mention that. Uh, Back in the day, we would go through clerks so often, and it's really refreshing having Jeremy <laughs> sticking around that's and true. continuing this work. So that's that's all I want to say just before I vote yes. It really is. <laughs> yeah. And treasurers. We went through treasurers rather a lot, Treasure, too. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I am closing the floor in the nominations. Do I have any objections to Jeremy Matt as clerk? Can I object to myself? There, I'm just kidding. Any, do I have any abstentions? You'll still be outvoted, Jeremy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jeremy, Matt, congratulations. You're our clerk. You win. Okay. That is the conclusion of officers' elections. Um, something that we do need to address at some point in the near future is... The rules stipulate that um, that I mean the the statute says that the terms are supposed to be staggered for I think for these positions and for 
the executive committee positions, but I'm not sure how we would do that. And that's something that we're gonna need to figure out. So I just wanted to acknowledge that the statute says that, but we don't have a method that, that we've decided on for how to do that yet. So I just wanted that to be on the record, but that we're, we're gonna work on that um, for, for, this, for this next whatever. Okay, so the next thing I have is, I am hoping once again, because I am a complete scatterbrain when it comes to actually writing these uh, motions out. The next discussion we have is preliminary proposal discussion. This is relating to discussions with collaboration with NEK uh, broadband. And as such, we want to enter, we want to discuss entering into executive session. Um, because of premature knowledge thing. And Jeremy Mack, go ahead. Uh, I move that we find that holding a discussion of strategic planning and potential merger with NEK broadband would put CB fiber at substantial, substantial competitive disadvantage in accordance with one BSA section 313A. Second. Okay, motion made by Jeremy Matt, seconded by Tom Fisher. Do I have any objections to this motion? I am not seeing any objections to this motion. Do I have any abstentions from this motion? I am not seeing any abstentions. Okay, the motion passes. And now for motion two. And um, before I think we, we get want to, to that. include. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask because I mean, I'm sure we want to include staff. Um, yes, I was just going to say, does staff, Bonnie also we have include alternates? We want to include Bonnie as a consultant. Bonnie is a consultant, and has well, we don't need to include alternates because they're they're part of the board. So they're part of the board. Being, okay. Um. So. So. Okay, but we do want to include Bonnie, staff, and board, Bonnie. and consultants with pertinent information. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so. Whereas the governing board has found that discussion of strategic planning of potential merger with NEK broadband in open session would put CD fiber at uh, a competitive disadvantage, move that we enter executive session to discuss these topics and that staff and consultants uh, with relevant information are invited into the executive session as they have information that is needed in accordance with one VSA section 313A1B. Second. A motion made by Jeremy Matt, seconded by Tom Fisher. Do I have any objections to this motion? I am not seeing any objections. Do I have any abstentions from this motion? Not seeing any abstentions, the motion passes. Jeremy, yes, Jeremy, can you stop the recording, please? At 6.39. At yes, 6.39 p.m. 